welcome members and guests to the December 19th program of the City Club of Eugene. Today's program is our annual gifts to the city. Our MC today is Leanne Jashua. Thank you so very much. It's an honor to be here. It's nice to know that at least one thing hasn't gotten canceled by the North Koreans, so we're good. <laughs> and you got me out of taste testing a friend's first effort at making fruitcakes this afternoon, so thanks for that too. I am honored to be here, and I just have to say, I have given gifts to the city before, and I have been here on a gift-giving day before, and sooner or later, Eugene is going to have everything. So I think next year, we're just going to get Eugene a card that says a goat has been donated to a family in Uruguay, <laughs> and that'll just be it. <laughs> because if you think about it, Eugene already has so very much. We have um, at least one dog in every car. Personally, I believe that the Subaru Forester comes with a golden retriever standard. The lab is an upgrade. Or the other way, depending on which dog you prefer. We have casual Friday every day of the week. You just can't really beat that. And there are baristas here who don't freak out when you order the free-range, fair-trade, organic, gluten-free, vegan brownies with your latte. And I would know. We have people with names like Snowflake and Toad Sprocket. We have a mayor named Kitty, but not for very long, unfortunately, so I'm thinking we need to start looking for somebody with the name of SpongeBob or Popeye to be our next mayor, because it's hard to live up to the name of Kitty, and it's hard to live up to all she's done for our city as well. So what do you give the city who has everything. Hopefully we'll have some really wonderful ideas from the roster of gift givers today, but I, as I was thinking about this last night, I was watching a little television while eating dinner, and you know, every year the same stupid gift ideas come back on advertising, so here are some things not to give the city, and hopefully they're not on anybody's list. The Brother P Touch Labeling System. You know, the thing that you make labels for everything? Because Eugene doesn't believe in labeling people or things. That does make it harder to tell the oregano from the parsley. But uh, <laughs> that's just my little joke there. Soda Stream, have you seen the ads for this thing? So soda is probably one of the leading causes of obesity and diabetes. So let's make it easy for people to make their own. Next up, the insulin infusion a machine that allows you to make your own diabetes medications. And you can set it on the shelf at the same place. So we are celebrating the holidays, a lovely tree in the back. I have to say I celebrate December 25th, Jimmy Buffett's birthday. That's right, excellent. Oh, there's Joel in the back. And if you've never celebrated Jimmy Buffett's birthday and you'd like to join me, let me tell you, you just have to make a few alterations to your regular celebration. Instead of rum, you put tequila in your eggnog. And then when you go caroling, you wear a Hawaiian shirt and you sing Margaritaville first. So it doesn't really change the rest of it. So I want to get us moving forward with our program. And I just want to let all of the um, gift givers know that I did a little research in preparation for emceeing today, otherwise known as internet stalking. So I may have some information. <laughs> And I will say this, when you're internet stalking, do not Google the word unusual gifts for adults. <laughs> you can't unsee those things. Unlike, unlike. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started with our first presenter. So on my notes, it says, George Russell needs to go first because he has to leave town. OK, I'm game. What did you do? Mispronounce Marcus Mariota's name or something? <laughs> So George is, the, is a principal in George Russell and Associates, an education and management consulting firm here in Eugene. He retired in 2011 as the superintendent of the Eugene Public Schools, having served in that role from March 1998 to July 2011. In August 2014, Mr. Russell returned to work with the county on an interim basis as the Director of Management Services, where he oversees financial services and county clerk and elections functions, among other management responsibilities, proving that he has not yet gotten a handle on the whole meaning of the word retirement. 
And if you want to know who to complain to about how an election turned out, now you know who to email. So please give a warm round of applause for George Russell, our first gift giver. Uh, my gift to the city for 2015 is a sacred heart. But I'm not talking about the hospital sacred heart. The sacred heart I'd give the hospital, not I'd give the city of Eugene, would be one that supports the lifeblood of a community. It's the one described by Ron Heifetz in his book, Leadership on the Line. It's the capacity to encompass the entire range of the human experience without hardening or closing ourselves to new possibilities. It's the ability, even in the throes of frustration, disappointment, and defeat, to remain connected to people as the source of the community's most profound purpose. Our habits, values, and attitudes, our community norms, even the dysfunctional ones, are part of the community's identity. To change the way the community sees and does things is to challenge how it defines itself as a community. The challenges we face will require the community to undergo some changes in its norms. It does not mean that all norms have to change, but it does mean that some norms must. To paraphrase Jim Collins in From Good to Great, great communities continually remind themselves of the crucial distinction between core and non-core values, between what should never change and what should be open for change, between what is really sacred and what is not. A sacred heart allows us to hear, feel, and diagnose in the midst of change so that we can accurately gauge the different situations and respond appropriately. Otherwise, we simply cannot sustain or comprehend the reasons behind a community's anger and frustration as they try to cope with the losses that they feel as members of a community. Having a sacred heart also includes creating spaces for individuals and groups who differ from us, then listening to their stories and learning from them as we reflect and interact with the reflective narratives of others, we develop the ability to talk with people, to relate to and to appreciate and understand each other across differences. It is about acknowledging and understanding the power and impact that cultural differences can have upon the quality of interactions between our social institutions and the people they serve. In America's cradle to prison pipeline, the Children's Defense Fund posed some questions that have helped me frame some of the issues that I see we face in securing and maintaining a sacred heart in our community. I want to reframe and pose those questions like this. If, as a community, we are not supporting our children with attention, time, love, discipline, resources, and the teaching of multicultural values, then are we of a sacred heart. If in our churches, synagogues, or mosques, we profess to be people of faith, but believe the Sermon on the Mount, the Ten Commandments, the Koran, or whatever religious or core beliefs we hold, pertain only to us, and exclude those who are different from us, then are we of a sacred heart. In our homes, offices, or social gatherings, if we tell, snicker, or wink at racial or ethnic, gender or homophobic, or religious jokes, or we engage in or acquiesce to practices intended to diminish rather than enhance other human beings, and that contribute to the voices of division and intolerance in our community, then are we of a sacred heart. If in our schools, families, or homes, 
we think it's somebody else's responsibility to teach our children social and cultural values, respect of differences, the golden rule, and habits related to ensuring their own and others' psychological and physical safety, then are we of a sacred heart? I think not yet. So I give to the city this gift of a sacred heart, a gift for which re-gifting is not only acceptable, but expected and highly encouraged. Thank you, George. I love that so much. I teach a class at the University of Oregon for freshman students called College, or called, um, com oh, right, I just have to remember what it's called is all I have to do. Um, college Hero or Bully, in which we look at racism, misogyny, ageism, and homophobia in comedy and how we can change the way we think through the what we it, it put into our lives and put out of our lives from what we put in to our brains and comedy and the jokes that we kind of tell. So I'm totally with you on that sacred heart. Wonderful. Okay, let's bring up our next presenter. Carrie Westland has served as president and CEO of Travel Lane County since 1996. Do you get the idea that once in a job here in Eugene, people stay forever? Um, she has 36 years of experience in the hospitality industry, half in Oregon and half in Alaska, so she can fold a napkin to look both like a Doug fur or an orca whale. According to her Facebook page, yes, I checked, Carrie is very into fitness activities. She runs, she plays dodgeball, and she's into cycle pubs. Okay, maybe that last one is more for drinking than biking, but... It was there, but she doesn't sit still for long. It's amazing that people have managed to pin her down long enough for her to be past chair, or should that be past running shoe, of the Oregon Tourism Commission, both the Oregon and Western Associations of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, and the Oregon Track Club. She, is curr she currently chairs the Statewide Tourism and Hospitality Consortium and the Arts and Business Alliance of Eugene. Give a big round of applause for Carrie. I don't know how you found that out. You know my Facebook page is set to private. You must be one of my friends on there. My Facebook page is set to private, but I have like 8,000 friends, so not too private. And just uh, on behalf of the pub cycle, you really do not get to drink on the pub cycle. You only get to exercise. It's my honor to uh, be here today, and my gift to Eugene is an oft-told wish to bring to life a gathering place befitting our beautiful city, ensuring its economic future and status as Oregon's second largest city. It is a wish about strategic, civic, and economic planning that will help us succeed and thrive in an increasingly competitive world. My gift is a regional convention center located in downtown Eugene. Eugene is a vibrant hub of healthy local assets, from farmers markets, highly reputed locavore restaurants, craft breweries and nearby organic wineries, quality visual and performing arts, to outdoor recreation paths, trails, and parks. Eugene truly is a great city for the arts and the outdoors, and one of Oregon's finest places to live and to visit. Eugene is the heartbeat of Oregon's second largest metro area and Lane County. It's the context for the University of Oregon and other schools, a mecca for sporting events and conventions that draw hundreds of thousands of visitors and their dollars every year. Some from small towns use Eugene as their commercial hub, buying their cars, appliances, clothing, and more while they're here watching their children compete or while they're participating in gatherings like the Oregon Logging Conference. But more and more, statewide associations cannot meet here. As our state's population has grown and statewide associations have gotten larger, they simply don't fit into our 30-year or more old facilities. Other Oregon cities have wooed away our customers to newer conference centers with the latest technology, with natural light, with more exhibit space. 
And now those newer facilities are expanding in size beyond our largest full service conference center at the downtown Hilton Eugene. My gift is meeting space at least twice our current size of 30,000 square feet, attached to a hotel and surrounded by restaurants, retail, and arts and culture. It could be, and maybe it should be, located just across the street from the Hilton, sold in combination with our current conference center, requiring much less public investment for the needed result and rising the tide of economic energy downtown. A regional convention center absolutely will generate future economic returns to our city and also maintain it as a centralized statewide gathering place just as the Hilton Eugene Conference Center has done over the last 30 years. And that has import not just economically, but also on Eugene's ability to influence the future of Oregon. My gift to Eugene is an important piece of our economic and civic future in the heart of downtown. To receive my gift, the city, business leaders, and citizens will need to champion the investment needed to achieve it. It will take several years of concentrated and sequential effort to accomplish and consistent political support. If that work begins in earnest now, city leaders can ensure Eugene remains the largest and most influential cultural, social, and economic hub for our state outside of Portland. Our next presenter is Juan Carlos Valle, who has been an Oregonian for over 30 years and has moss on his north side to prove it. He, works for the city of, he has worked for the city of Eugene for 12 years and has been employed by the federal government for the past 10. He served as chair of the Eugene Police Commission, where he advised the Eugene Police Chief, City Manager, and City Council on best police practices and policies, something many other cities could clearly use. He was recently elected chair of the Crest Drive Neighborhood Association in Eugene, is the first council president for LULAC, a national civil rights and advocacy organization, and is vice president of the Social Security Administration Hispanic Affairs Advisory Council for Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, perhaps the longest name of any organization I've ever seen written down. But on the other hand, he clearly has recently flunked his class on being in nothingness because he's way too busy. Please give a warm round of applause for Juan Carlos. I was called by the program committee to, to in fact, accept the honor of being here in front of you to present his gift to the city. My first question to the program committee person was, what's expected of me? And then the second one was, do I have to behave? <laughs> and there was no answer, so I guess, I don't have to do the second one. I, by all means, I am not an inspirational speaker. I, in fact, I'm not an entertainer. I'm not tall and handsome dude to, to look at. So I'm not even going to present to you anything original. In fact, my humble gifts to the city today are the following. On August 12, 1939, MGM Studios premiered The Wizard of Oz based on the classic novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. It has been over 75 years, and this film continues to be one of the most beloved and watched films of all time. Now I plan on flying through the first two gifts, like the flying monkeys but I plan on spending some time on the third one as he resting on the field of puppies. Now this movie, as some of you may know, features a girl who's looking for a way to get back home, a tin man looking for a heart, a scarecrow seeking a brain, and a lion seeking for what well, you know. Fine, I'm going to get to the first gift. There are groups out there who put out hundreds and hundreds of hours of hard work to missions on our behalf. There are consultants, experts, teachers, examiners, thinkers. In other words, they are the real movers and shakers. I'm afraid they're not necessarily recognized as such by us. I see them at events, but they're not introduced. 
I see them roaming around the city, but they're invisible. I see them at your schools, at your work, but no trace of them attending. I see them on the streets, under the sun, but we can't see their shadow. So to all the city of Eugene boards and commissions, I am here to present you this diploma for the use of your collective wisdom and for the use of every inch of your brain. And on this day, I hereby recognize you and thank you for your service. Now I was told that you can only poke at your friends, your close friends, and your colleagues every once in a while and on special occasions and on a limited time as well. Okay. So the tin man seeking a heart finds it in an unlikely place. Established in blah, 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 for the purpose of blah, 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 blah. The police commission has had its chair of pumping blood through its system. Oxygen is now needed to keep it awake. But after so many battles and so many good deeds to keep some out there on their toes, a new heart is needed. So now that a response is needed to prevent a Ferguson or to ensure New York doesn't happen in Eugene, a new and improved heart is needed for the police commission. A heart that pumps new hope and gives oxygen to folks, groups, kids and tots, so they, we, can breathe and be safer. So, Police Commission, this heart, it's for you. Finally, just like the lion in the Wizard of Oz, courage for Eugene. Yes, courage is what I said. What does it mean? Well, as defined in a source, courage is the ability and willingness to confront fear, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Our greatest strength must come from within. We can no longer afford to be idle when segments of the population have no support. We cannot live in the shadows of inaction. We must learn to see the opportunities and the uniqueness of the makeup of our demographics. We must recognize the intellect of living in a university town. We must figure out where we have been and what we need to do so we understand which direction we need to go. But it takes courage. So, Eugene, Here's a lion for you. <laughs> How to use this gift, you may ask? Well, perhaps Eleanor Roosevelt had an idea. She once said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I live through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. Eugene, your time to reshape things for us and to truly use what we have in our backyard is now. You must view it as an opportunity to shine, an opportunity to speak and stand up to injustice and inequities. Even President Truman said, make men make history and not the other way around. In periods where there is no leadership, society, stands still. Progress occurs when courageous, skillful leaders seize the opportunity to change things for the better. But we must also remember the words of President Kennedy. He said, efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. But how do we find courage? It must be grown and modeled by all, as Maya Angelou noted, 
One isn't necessarily born with courage, but one is born with potential. Without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. We can't find true, merciful, generous, or honesty. Eugene, you have lots of men and women and young adults that are ready for your courage. By now you will agree that these gifts are not original. It may have been mentioned somewhere sometime, even earlier today. So to all of you out there listening and those who I'm getting the gift of courage right now, Glenda, the good witch, told Dorothy, she had always the power to go home. To that, Dorothy said, why was I not informed before? What was the response? You know, because you have to find out for yourself. You have to start from the beginning. Yep, there is no place like home. Even Dorothy would say, if I ever have to go looking for my heart desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, then I never lost it to begin with. So City Club of Eugene, a residence of my beloved Eugene, go to and start from the beginning. Just follow the yellow brick road. And yeah, it takes what? Courage. Thank you. Could we also get the red sparkly shoes too? Because that could symbolize audacity. Although I don't think Eugene needs the gift of audacity. I think we already have that gift, right? But speaking of audacity, um, what do you get when you combine a pinch of wizard with a dollop of Freddie Mercury and just a whiff of garden slug? This year's amazing slug queen, please bow or curtsy in your seat to him, her, and me as an old slug queen. You can do that now. That's fine. They can't see it on the radio. They won't know. Um, this year's amazing slug queen. Uh, uh, let's see where I was. At. Okay. As one does, slug queen Professor Bulbous Slimeldor has another personality, Daniel Borson, a software development at eWeb, which I believe stands for Eugene's Wet Everybody Boogie. He also performs in local theater, sometimes even when invited. Here to give us our next gift to the city, Professor Bulbous Slimeldor. So for those of you out in radio land, I am holding in my hand a large box gift wrapped in shiny green paper with a sparkly red bow. But my gift to the city of Eugene is not what's inside the box, oh no. My gift to the city of Eugene is what's outside the box. Eugene has a reputation of being a quirky and idiosyncratic city, and we slug queens are, if nothing else, quirky and idiosyncratic. Isn't that right, Leanne? So, listen to your queen. Eugene faces many issues as a city which I believe could be helped by what's outside the box. Let me start with a little exercise for you. Imagine, if you will, that you are driving a little two-seater convertible sports car and you pass a bus stop and there at the bus stop you see three people. An elderly woman who's in need of immediate medical attention, a dear old friend who once saved your life, and the beautiful person whom you know in your heart is, your, is the true love of your life but you only have room for one passenger in the car. What do you do? Well, while you are pondering that, let me say a bit more about the power of what's outside the box. Frequently, people focus on specific solutions instead of what needs those solutions would meet. Oh, sure, that one solution you want may meet your need, but there may be several other solutions that might meet the needs of other people as well. I believe that if we got enough creative people, and Eugene certainly has a plethora of those, people who think outside the box, we could come up with more win-win and even win-win-win solutions. 
oh, maybe not everyone would be enthusiastic with the outcome, but I believe that we could get outcomes that everyone could live with. For example, an, an outside-the-box idea I had. Oh, many, many years ago, Eugene tried to turn Broadway and Willamette downtown into a pedestrian mall. Well, that idea went south. But now we have a much more vibrant downtown, and it would be nice every now and then to have full access to the streets on night when Eugene is busy on Saturday nights or Friday art walks. But then you don't want to upset traffic when downtown is empty. What do you do? An outside-of-the-box idea. Why not close off the streets temporarily when there's something going on, and then, after the people leave, remove the barriers and open it up to traffic again. Oh, there are many more ideas that I'm sure all of you could think up for any of the issues that Eugene faces. So back to our exercise of the bus stop. Now, if you were thinking outside the box and thinking about how everyone might get their needs met, you might have figured out that you could give your car to your friend who could then drive the elderly woman to the hospital. Meanwhile, you wait at the bus stop with the love of your life. <laughs> win, 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 and hopefully a big win. <laughs> so the next time you face a problem, remember my gift to the city and think about what's outside the box. So may you all have a delightful holiday season and a fabulously slimy 2015. Thank you so much. I was stuck, Daniel, because if I'm riding in a two-seater car, there will be three dachshunds in the other seat, and I was going to have to answer with whatever person was willing to let them ride on his or her lap. I, I love the idea of thinking outside the box for Eugene. I was on the Eugene Celebration Parade Committee one year when we had difficulty because the police were going to actually be at the game and we were going to have to move the parade earlier and we were talking about options. And my option was to have the parade stand completely still and have the pedestrians walk down the sidewalks and we wouldn't need any police. And to Eugene and the Eugene Celebration Parade Committee's great benefit, I will say that we talked about this seriously for 20 minutes. <laughs> so I am very pleased to live in a town where people don't automatically assume I'm just nuts. Okay. Our n I want to make sure, do I... Are you next, Bill? Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, it changed and I, did, I neglected to move things around on the little Rubik's Cube of the arrangement here. Okay, so our next presenter was part of Occupy Village Eugene documentary, which won first place in an independent film festival. She is thrilled to be part of the success of that film and to help spread the word about Occupy Village Eugene and its mission and goals. She also spreads a lot of peanut butter as a mother and a grandmother. Can you give a warm wel welcome to Rika Rogers? Uh, I am really um, impressed and pleased with the things that have uh, come before us, the things that have been said, um, and uh, a lot of the thoughts uh, George and Juan had are on the, uh, the same uh, energy and level of what I would like to give to the city of Eugene. My gift, I, I would like to say that I gave this a lot of thought, but to tell you the truth, there was really ol only one thing that I feel not only that I could come before you to give to you, but I really think that I can give to you. And although it's not tangible, uh, I believe that I can give this gift to you. And my gift to you is the knowledge of your own greatness. And the reason that I feel that I'm able to come before you and give you this gift is because this was something that was given to me. I believe in each and every one of you and your power to change the world. I really do. Um, when we make the city of Eugene better for any of its people, we improve the quality of life for all of its citizens and the world because of that. You have strength and abilities that you may only begin to understand by the conscious intention of taking a chance on yourself and on one another. To know that we are all counselors, teachers, helpers, and caregivers, that to help to heal, to listen, to be a voice for those that have no voice, 
These are the things that we can do every day. The ultimate healing comes when we reach out to others. In helping others, we become more complete and whole within ourselves. This town is ready, ready to understand the supreme being inside each and every one of you. Some of you may already know this. Uh, these concepts are not new. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I, like I said, I believe in each and every one of you. We are all counselors, teachers, helpers, and caregivers. With every kindness, with every smile that we give, with every offense overlooked, sometimes the words that are unspoken are the ones that carry the most weight. It's not difficult to conceive of these ideas in your head. I understood these things as a concept long before they were allowed to seep into my heart and my spirit. I'm a dreamer. I want you to be a dreamer too. I stand before you to present this gift because it's a gift that was given to me at a time when I had lost all hope. And someone came into my life and they saw something inside of me that was there but that I wasn't able to see at the time. And this person helped me to understand and to see that the only limitations in my life are the ones that I create and accept for myself. I really believe that we're co-creators. Every single day, every moment of every day, that we decide, we create life with everything that we do and say and who we are. And that's a massive power. That is an incre incredible amount of not just a chance and an opportunity, but also we have obligations and responsibilities at that point because we have the power to change things every moment with everything that we do and say. So my gift to you is that I believe in you. I believe in you and I believe in the greatness within each and every one of us. And you may not know it, but it, it doesn't matter because I know it. Thank you. Very nice. We've gotten some wonderful gifts so far, correct? Are you happy with them? Yes. All right, so next up is overachiever Bill Sullivan. Bill is an outdoor kind of guy who has written, count them, 18 books about Oregon and a monthly outdoor column for the Register Guard. Bill, I don't know if you know this, but writers are supposed to stay inside and be allergic to trees and stuff. If you know Bill, he never stays inside. He's always outside doing stuff. Not to mention that for a guy who spends all his life hiking, he has really good manners. Only once has he stolen a salmon from me, so there's that. He's an avid fundraiser for Friends of Eugene Public Library, beloved by local authors, and was recently voted the man most likely to be growing mushrooms in his beard. Please give a warm round of applause to Bill Sullivan. Well, I don't know about any of that, but I was, a friend suggested to me that as the hiking guru, that what I should really give everyone in Eugene is a swift kick. And, and I said, well, that's not my style. And besides, I found that you have to lure people off their duff. And so what I want to give everybody is an elegant weekend getaway to a hot springs with no cars, no telephones, and no televisions. And you know, this is actually, this is a real thing. This is what my wife and I give each other each time I finish a book project. Yeah, you ready to go? Here's, here's the first step. First thing you do is you go down to the library or to a bookstore and you buy that book or get that book that you've always wanted to read and haven't had the time. Some, I don't know, historical novel, um, murder mystery, a collection of short stories, whatever. You, get, you each get a book and you put it in a backpack and also in the backpack you put some wine and cheese and crackers, you know, the essentials. And then uh, you probably should also take, uh, considering where I'm sending you, uh, a warm coat, rugged boots, and some survival gear. Because I'm going to suggest that you take that backpack and you go to downtown Eugene. And when you're there, you get on a bus going up the McKinsey River. Now, Lane Transit does this. The buses are, you know, less than two bucks. For $1.75, you can do this trip. But it's not like the other city buses. This one goes up a scenic canyon deep into the woods. Uh, it's, you, um, 
And, and in, if you're not driving, it, it really does feel like you're going on vacation. The bus goes clear to the end of the line. It's just past McKinsey Bridge and turns around at this remote ranger station. Okay, get out there. Across the street is the McKinsey River Trail. This is one of the most beautiful paths on the planet. Giant old growth trees, moss everywhere, the roaring white water of the river right beside you. Okay, hike up the trail three miles. Um, and this time of year, there's probably going to be water standing in the trail. It might be a skiff of snow, trees are dripping. There's a good chance you'll wind up cold and wet, but you're going to a hot springs. And, uh, now, I don't approve of everything that Belknap Hot Springs Resort has done to that old-time resort up, up the McKinsey, but the old pool is still there, and it's great. Um, so you dive into the pool and soak for a while, and you're watching the mist rise up and the rivers roaring by, and then you go up and get one of the lodge rooms, and they don't have a restaurant there, so that's why you brought the uh, cheese and crackers. And there's no televisions, that's why you brought the books, you actually will have time to read them and to talk and to look out the window as night falls, the stars come out, maybe the snow falls down, flakes, and the mist rises off the pool and vanishes into the tree boughs above the river. Well, now eventually you're going to have to hike back out on that trail, but uh, when you do ride the bus back into town, I guarantee you that you will feel like you've had a month's vacation from your workday stress out there on that hike, and you will have done the two most important things I think you can do for your mental and physical health, walking and reading. It turns out that humans are unique in the animal kingdom as having been designed to walk and think. And yet, most of the, many of the devices that we've invented lately, and probably some of the gifts you're gonna get this holiday season, are designed to do the opposite to make you sit and be entertained. But you really do need to activate. You've got to exercise these things. And so my gift to you is uh, the, take the time to go out and uh, take a hike and read a book. And happy trails. Can we all get on the bus at the same time? Because I'm going. All right. So the first thing you know, need to know about Andrea Ortiz is the, she is not the Andrea Ortiz who will teach you how to do a smoky eye on her YouTube account because there is that. I found it when I Googled it. <laughs> Andrea was a Eugene City Councilor for eight years. That's like 60 in City Council time. But it was a breeze for her because she's been married for 40 years and is the mother of three sons. So really she was just getting away. Um, Andrea is currently president of Kids First Board of Directors, serves on the Food for Lane County Board of Directors, works for Peace Health at the University District Emergency Room, and has just gotten her multitasking badge in the Girl Scouts. Please, a warm one, round of applause for Andrea. This is so exciting. I haven't been in front of a podium and people in so long. It feels good. I want to thank the City Club for allowing me to share publicly. Uh, speak publicly. I thought about this request a lot afterward, after John had asked me, and I think that there was some short-term and some long-term um, wishes, gifts, that I would like to leave with the city of Eugene. The first one that came to my mind is the political will for our elected officials to do the right thing when it comes to human beings. To use your political capital and not worry about your next election. And of course the right Way, the right thing is my way of thinking, so, you know. And that can be a short-term goal because you can always get elect, uh, voted out the next election cycle. Uh, my second gift that I thought of was I'd like to give the gift of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace back to our community. Um, I wish for the return of acute care services at the Sacred Heart University District. Um, this is a longer-term wish. Um, I wish for all the citizens of Eugene to see what I see through the eyes, through my eyes, what, uh, when I'm at work. Down at the University District ER, we are kind of the epicenter for services for the mental health community. We do a really good job. We don't do the best, there's not enough beds statewide, but in my opinion, from what I see, the people that work with me give such good care and treat people with dignity and respect. It would do your hearts good. These are all young people. These are our children and our grandchildren. 
it it's, um, gives me hope for tomorrow. This, um, it's hard to think of what else I would give the city of Eugene because I think we do pretty good. I would just hope that our community keeps keeping on. We take pride in our community. We take care of our environment. Our parks and our schools are well supported by all. And there's general support for, to address the, the needs of those going through rough times. I guess the last thing I would wish for the city of Eugene is to hurry up and finish the new city hall. City of Eugene government needs its own home. So our next gift giver is Mary Layton. Mary just ended a career with a seven year stint as the principal of the Network Charter School here in Eugene. Despite what you may have heard, she did not call herself into the principal's office to do that. By the way, Mary, I spelled principal correctly in my notes. Just think you should know that. She joined the City Club in 2006 and has served as program chair and president and now works on, the special, on special City Club projects. Her main claim to fame in Eugene these days is that she is a mother of Marty and Rose Wildy, both active in the community and the grandmother of Bella, who aspires to be president of City Club someday when she's older than nine. So my gift to City Club is encouragement to insert an alternative narrative into any scenario where you find yourself on the opposite side of an argument about what is best in the community. The dominant narrative seems to be the others have always been wrong-headed or just plain bad. The story we use to explain their position includes choices they made in ignorance on the path to the dark side where they cannot see the truth, truth which is, of course, our own position. We write letters and opinion pieces naming the names of these evildoers based on our belief in the story we made up about the origins of their position. I propose an alternative that could change the way we talk to each other when we disagree. Imagine the others have grown up as we have, more or less, that they espouse the same values and wish for the same social goods but have simply come to a different conclusion about how to achieve them. What would our conversations be like then? Let me give an example. Once upon a time, I was teaching a basic math class in the LCC high school completion program. The topic was ratio and proportion. Despite my best efforts, nobody got the answers right. Given the mischievous, wisecracking ways of this group, I assumed the worst. My story of their failure was about laziness, lack of interest in math, and deeply ingrained habits of resisting instruction. I could picture the suffering they had imposed on the teachers before me who tried to help them with this stuff. Nevertheless, I asked for volunteers to describe their problem-solving strategies so we could figure out where to go from here. One student explained very thoughtfully how he had approached the problem. He had broken it into sensible pieces, put them in the right order, attacked them one at a time, and come up with an answer that could have been right. He had worked hard, taken the task seriously, and used mathematical thinking just as I'd hoped he would. He had simply made an error in calculation along the way and come up with the wrong final answer. I learned a lot about him by listening to his explanation I learned a lot about the math problem in front of us. And most importantly, I came to respect his efforts as a learner. In this case, his answer was wrong, and mine was right, but the difference wasn't about character, and either of us could have made the mistake. We know from extensive research on learning outcomes that when a teacher believes the student is capable of learning and willing to reach, the teacher behaves differently. She is warm, but challenging. She helps, but expresses confidence in the learner's ability. And the behavior of the teacher creates conditions that nurture more productive effort. It is not the magic of high expectations at work. It is the alternative narrative, the story the teacher tells herself about the nature and history of the student that leads to behaviors that lead to success. And the wonderful thing about this dynamic is that even if the teacher is wrong, even if the kid really is just messing up and not paying attention, the teacher's behavior usually transforms the encounter and brings their work into alignment. 
I give to my community encouragement to approach all of our differences with this alternative narrative. In place of the stories we tell ourselves about the opposition's flawed thinking, historical ill will, and poor values, we could insert a story in which the opposition wants what we want. Shelter for the homeless, food for the hungry, decent wages and benefits, peace on earth, and high test scores. Let us see ourselves all in the roles in a bigger community-wide story where our differences may often be based on simple calculation errors or procedural glitches. We will sometimes have different values and different goals, but in the long run, choosing to believe of each other that we hold the welfare of the whole community at the center of our intentions will lead to behaviors that make our work more productive and our community more nurturing for all. And our last gift giver of the afternoon is Rabbi Yitzhak Husbands Hankins, who definitely has the longest name of any of our presenters today. He is a senior rabbi, rabbi at Temple Beth Israel, but you also may not know this about him. He's a composer of Jewish liturgical music, a cellist, and a guitarist. His music is sung at synagogues throughout the country in Europe and in Israel. He has several recordings to his credit and is currently compiling a songbook of his compositions. It's all about the cello is not one of them. Please, a warm round of applause for Rabbi Yitz, as Daniel said, I could call him. Thank you very much for this honor to um, have an, oppor an opportunity to offer a gift to our city. Uh, the gift that I want to offer is of two parts. One is a personal reflection on the city, a good reflection, a loving reflection of the place that we share together and um, how richly Nourish, nourishing and wonderful it's been in my life. I came here in 1971, a young man in a VW van with an, a friend when we were all coming out from the East Coast. And after living in an industrial city in, in Pittsburgh before its renaissance, I came out here to what was the Garden of Eden in my life experience. I found the trees to be so wonderful, the scent that you would smell from the blossoms in the trees wafting down the, the way as you walked, and the, the beautiful clear waters that we didn't have back in Pittsburgh at that time, but we could go swimming in Winbury Creek here, this beautiful crystal clear water. Nature was alive and well here. I tasted my first corn from the garden in front of the, my first home that I shared with others. There was a university here, a wonderful university where I could go and study music and have the pleasure of um, a, a symphony here where I had an opportunity to, pr to play and a place where I could continue my passion for disability rights, a place where I could work in organizations and that helped the human rights for disabled people, that, that human rights movement to make progress. I even was blessed to find a loving partner here who grew up in Oregon of all places and raised two daughters here and they were able to go to schools that were wonderful in, and to participate in CALC's uh, youth for Justice program and to learn about the importance of, of the exploration and the work standing with other people in the community for justice and other very fundamental human needs and rights. I found a community to pray in and to develop my Jewish identity and spiritual life and even in grow in the midst of the community and be granted opportunities to lead. I found wonderful colleagues for interfaith work, sharing values from our varied traditions that brought us together repeatedly to stand together for human rights, peace, and many other shared concerns, to deepen our friendships and commitments to the strength of shared efforts. 
I found a community where religious and belief systems didn't divide, but united us in prayer and action. I found a city that responded in times when the Jewish community was the target of vicious hate crimes. It was one of the most powerful experiences of my life to see the hundreds upon hundreds of people standing in solidarity with the Jew Jewish community when we were uh, under attack. I found a city leadership here that stepped up at times of public insensitivity that was hurtful to the Jewish community and to other minority faith communities. I found law enforcement that stood by to protect the safety of the Jewish community in times of threat and possible danger. I found a, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious and non-religious peace and justice organization, CALC, that gave me opportunities to stand with others for, com for common cause. I found a city that was ready to grow in awareness of human rights and accessibility for alter able people, a place where increasing safety and support and human rights have grown dramatically over the decades for our LGBTQ neighbors and good friends. I could go on and on about the richness of the beauty of the reflection that I carry in my heart, in my own life experience, as I was so fortunate to find Eugene to come to this place that has been so good in my life. Today is the third day of Hanukkah. I brought something, a symbol that you may be familiar with, a Hanukkah or a menorah. And the light of, of Hanukkah is understood to be a light that allows us to see the best, the best in each other, the best in the world, the best in creation. It elevates our ability to see this and to see the, have a sense of awe for the beauty of creation itself, for the wonder of nature to be in a state of awe for the beauty of life and the purpose of life. I pray and I hope that, and I seek for this city to be able for the residents, those of us who live here or those who travel into our city for a short while or stay and become residents or visitors to be able to see the best in each other, to support the best in each other, to not look at the downside. We all have our downside, but this light and the hope and something that will help us grow is this gift of looking toward the best in each other and drawing that up and nurturing that in one another. I know that in my experience, I've had a somewhat narrow experience, even though it's been touched by a broad community. I don't know what it's like to grow up in the city as a member of the black community or the Latino community, or to really face the challenges daily of uh, accessibility or having a gender preference or identity that is challenging for others to relate to. I don't know what it's like to be members of some of those parts of our city. And yet I hope that the light that I would love to gift our community is a light that encourages us and inspires us to look to places that we don't see yet, that we don't understand. To, to let that light inspire us to know that transformation is so possible and so necessary in this world. And to, as the, the the lights of the menorah stand side by side, each one distinct and independent, together the brilliance of standing side by side with others and serving higher purpose is what can really bring the light that I would love to see our community be radiant with. So 